<laughs> okay, welcome um, everyone out there in Cyberland. Um, so I'd like to begin by acknowledging um, our weirdy people of uh, Wangan and Jangalingu country, quite a mouthful. Um, they are the traditional owners of the land on which I am today in Clermont. And um, off, I offer my respects to elders past and present. I also acknowledge those on whose ongoing efforts to protect and promote Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures will leave a lasting legacy for future elders and leaders. And I extend that acknowledgement um, to the traditional owners of the land wherever you may be joining us from today. Uh, Watamali, or welcome. Uh, today's webinar topic is fraud, corruption and cybercrime landscape. So I'd like to welcome our presenter, Carolyn Eagle from Pacifica. Hi, Carolyn. Good morning. Um, Carolyn um, has been a director of Pacifica for 20 years, is the head of Pacifica's Assurance and Advisory Services Division. Much of her experience has been in assisting large multidisciplinary, well, lots of words, Carolyn, multidisciplinary <laughs> disciplinary organisations, primarily local governments, not for profit entities, uh, to establish and deliver efficient and effective internal audit and assurance functions to support executives achieving their organisational objectives. That is a lot of word. But basically, <laughs> Carolyn has extensive experience working within lo Queensland local government and other sectors and has gained from serving on boards and um, committees and head of internal audit. Geez, Carolyn, you've got a lot of letters after your name. <laughs> you are a fellow chartered I don't account. think you need to Wow, call but basically... Also. Auditors, risk management, um, institute of company directors, um, certified fraud examiners, uh, information systems audit, all sorts of things there. So um, to you can tell it's sum it all here. up, <laughs> to sum it all up, um, you got great experience um, around today's session. So um, today we're going to delve into the realms of fraud, corruption, privacy, cybersecurity and providing you with a comprehensive understanding of the risks in Australia and today's stage. Whew. The session today will be followed by a Q&A opportunity. So to submit those questions um, throughout the presentation, um, use the live Q&A button that's on the bottom toolbar of your screen. Um, and then feel free to submit them throughout the webinar. We'll be responding to them at the end of the presentation. So over to you, Carolyn. Great, thank you, Zoe. That's a lovely introduction, um, and hopefully gives an indication of where I spend my time. Uh, in sometimes a quite dry topic, but the interesting parts we'll hopefully talk about today. The um, I've got the uh, content summary that we'll cover here, but one of the key takeaways in the brief for this presentation is learning how to communicate with um, counsellors and senior managers about the risks and threats to the organisations that um, you work for. So a lot of what's in this deck is statistically based or it is information and data based because certainly in my view that's what captures the attention of, of those groups rather than hearsay or you know their own potential risk tolerances around these types of things. So um, that's probably the key takeaway is the evidence base um, and the data that sits behind that. Not local government specific, but if it hits health or it hits a not-for-profit that's large, local government is equally susceptible. So that's where this information sharing comes from. Um, and then from there, it'll, again, signal to those in the room, most of you anyway, um, being finance professionals, that your fundamental internal controls are what matter um, despite pressure from the organisation for efficiency, um, despite you know, operational expediency um, and ways to rely on system controls that perhaps haven't been built in the back end when implementations have come through or modules that have been intended to bring on additional internal controls perhaps haven't been turned on uh, as thought and access permissions as well. So I'm not going to go through any of those, but to say the evidence vindicates 
what finance professionals have been telling their organisations routinely, the benefits of procedures, practices, culture, um, and, and the like, workflows. So that's for a whole other discussion, but uh, the, these are the, the ways that um, you will be able to reinforce that importance um, to the organisation that you work for as well. So I wanted to jump into next was the understanding, the before kind of going through these slightly dry statistics, I wanted to take you through the interesting stuff, well, in my mind anyway, which is the rationale of a Fordster and their mindset the types of globally experienced um, fraud that's only detectable fraud and corruption, uh, and the most effective prevention and detection elements around that um, and their behaviours. So I have got some notes to the side, so if I'm looking across, it's just I want to give you the accurate information. And there's a link um, at the bottom of this slide and again at the end, which gives you um, the uh, an excellent uh, report with substantial infographics, which is what I'm relying on today. And the snapshots of those, if you cut them out of the document and put them in front of an audit committee, um, they'll put them in front of your senior exec or your CFO, it starts to elevate that conversation because it's quite stark. Um, and I you know, really appreciate that type of um, that type of reporting that captures an audience. So that that's there, you can access it. It's just come out as 2024 results and it's got comparatives to previous um, reports that they've done, 22 and then 2020, et cetera. So they've got a fantastic history um, there as well. So some good data. But what are the losses? 5% uh, of worldwide revenue created across all sectors, private, public, not-for-profits, whatever it may be. So 5% of revenue that um, is known to be taken you know in terms of quantifying things so if you think about your council what's your top line um you know revenue income streams it's possible that five percent of that could be subject to to fraud sort of on on average in terms of dollars for you in scale um, that's represented or estimated at around 3.6 billion dollars and that's of detectable fraud um, so far. So there is always additional there that is never discovered, um, particularly in um, cultures and countries where corruption is, you know, part of the staple life and way of doing business. 42% um, of fraud and corruption was detected from direct employee reporting, either anonymously or otherwise. The good thing there is that local government has a number of mechanisms uh, in order to to solicit that, uh, and and you're very good at putting those out, making staff aware, making the community aware, councillors aware, conflict of interest elements, you know, sit very strongly, codes of conduct, etc. So those avenues for reporting are quite strong in the local government sector in Queensland, in my view, compared to the, the wider global context. But 42% rely on your employees feeling comfortable to come forward in some form. So that goes to organisational culture, uh, the fraud and ethical conduct and culture that they, you know, that they experience um, in their comfort in doing so. 50% um, of the frauds worldwide were able to be perpetrated, no surprises here, 50% by either a lack of internal controls or internal control override. So that's you know, really, really telling and reinforcing what you already know and I've said earlier. The top three types um, of perpetrated fraud is asset um, and funds misappropriation, corruption after that, so benefits of, of use of position and power, and then um, the remainder is the financial statement fraud, which actually means owners and shareholders and execs gaining a financial reward or a bonus from critical results. And we know that that drives short-term behaviour. So that financial statements is making things look better than they actually are in order to gain a reward. Um, so there's, that's really, really um, interesting where that sits. And then if I just jump to the reasons um, and then the concealment methods 
as well on my just my documents here. So the red flags for you know being alert um, but not alarmed when it comes to people within your workplace, and this is only op occupational fraud that we're talking about here. So being alert but not alarmed, um, and and do pay attention. Living beyond means, forty five percent of that. That's quite obvious. Some of these will be very obvious. Um, unusually close associations with vendors and customers. That's an additional 25%. And there I would also indicate that in smaller communities where those relationships can go across blurred lines and there's also family members you know, working within organisations and the community, those types of inherent risks certainly sit there and controls are even more important. Um, the other red flag is the person's behaviour, control issues, unwillingness to share duties, unwillingness to take leave again, quite obvious. Their behaviour around bullying and intimidation of more junior staff or anyone that comes within their patch. So they make it very, very difficult for that person to have any satisfactory um, working conditions and therefore directs them away or or diverts them away because the way the other person feels through their own behaviour. Uh, finally, then 15% for irritability, defensiveness and suspiciousness. These are the ones where fraudsters are great at um, a poker face. They will make accusations about other people or insinuate certain things um, that inappropriate behaviour or practices might be occurring elsewhere in order to distract attention from themselves and look honourable and have integrity. So that's absolutely um, key. If you've got one of those squeaky wheels, sometimes it's worth considering these other red flags. Uh, family problems, gaming, gambling problems is the final sort of 50%. Um, hotlines in terms of telephone hotlines have lost their effectiveness it's email now so those councils that are you know have invested in hotlines um, telephone hotlines rather it may be worth just understanding the hits that those are getting um, and then look at the cost benefit of retaining those you know over the trends uh, in reporting so it it is something um, that yeah you know, the effectiveness of, of those controls is in, is important uh, fraudsters collaborating, it's up to 60% of more than, of two or more collaborative fraudsters in an organisation committing this fraud. Um, individuals obviously dropping at that rate. So there's, um, that's something to be critically aware of in segregation of duties and hierarchy of power. Um, just flipping through my last ones, oh, is the, is the how? which is around uh, falsifying documents. Uh, and that's that's the critical one, is how do they um, get away with it? 40% um, created fraudulent physical documents, 32% alloc uh, altered physical documents, 28%, so again, nearly th one third, created fraudulent electronic documents or files and put them in the system. Uh, and 25% altered electronic documents or files. So in that case, we're looking at potentially EFT uploads, payroll master file, you know, supply master file, et cetera. And then you move into the project management space and um, you know, grants, et cetera, from there. Uh, and 23% of those um, perpetrated crimes destroyed or withheld physical evidence, which goes to their defensiveness, bullying, intimidating behaviors. Um, so that's how they have done it. So again, internal controls, monitoring, detection are the key um, solves in that case. So uh, that takes me now to the data um, and we'll step through these. I've got about probably 30 minutes left. So I'll try and move through some of these. So there's 15 minutes for questions. Um, but that would be my by far the most exciting part of the conversation. So link up with that report um, to get all that and more. It's fantastic. So Crime and Corruption Commission is the first area um, just to give you some statistics on. So that, this is a little old, June 2020, 
the report came out, which meant the work would have been done in 2019, which was pre-COVID. So just putting putting that um, perspective on it. Um, one in six corruption had increased overall and they believed one in 10 uh, in the local government sector. So this is interviewees and respondents to self-assessment surveys. Increased in the workplace, um, one in 10 for that. Interestingly, and probably conversely, or maybe not so much conversely, but certainly interestingly, one third of respondents had never witnessed any behaviours. So that always has me thinking about the culture and the perception versus the reality. Um, and 40% had never witnessed it in other local governments that they have interacted with or worked for. Um, but that means 60% have witnessed it um, and 63% have seen such behaviours. So when you flip that over, you know, there's some, some certain perspectives there to take note of. Uh, consistently, misuse of authority and conflict of interest within local government, you know, separation of powers is critical and those are the two that signal. We'll have a look at the crime and corruption reporting dashboard in a couple more slides and I'll just highlight how this flows through at a number of, of levels. It, it um, continues to signal what you guys probably know, um, but equally reinforces that for councillors and others. Um, really pleasingly, in the local government survey, 66%, two thirds of officers believed that they would definitely report corruption if they had identified it. So belief and reality are different in my experience um, because when uh, the rubber hits the road and they they need to actually go and speak to someone, that level of confidence um, does drop away a little bit. Um, and even if they do report, those reports get withdrawn. So um, very honourable, indicating a strong ethical culture within those organisations or certainly adequate. Um, and it's it's pleasing to hear that, um, you know, 66% would be comfortable enough to definitely report from their own moral standpoint at the very least. 33% though, very clearly would not report. Um, a couple of these, well, all of them are organisational culture based, but the primary one is the view that nothing will be done about it. Now, this goes to the conundrum between the reporting officer, um, the investigation that goes on behind that, the, the um, reporting to the Triple C, and then um, you know the investigation that ensures the referral back to council, and then the action taken against the the person to which the complaint has been made about or the activities. It's difficult then because of the confidentiality aspects to close that loop with the original complainant. And so there is also a perception that nothing's being done about it. So really that's the critical part to continue to reinforce the proper behaviour is to find a way to keep the employee in the loop without um, betraying uh, them and any of council's legislative obligations you know, under referrals coming back. Um, the two thirds that would definitely report get the um, get the shakes around whether they've got enough evidence to back up their allegations, uh, and that's where you know they lose confidence in their ability to collect data. Um, really strong beliefs is that they, it would affect their career, so that's reprisal, affect their relationships internally and in smaller councils, which some of you are in, um, affect their relationships within the community, um, and and that comes to fears that. You know, if those allegations were made and unsubstantiated or, or substantiated, those individuals would, you know, have to contemplate leaving the region despite doing the ethical and proper thing. So a lovely graph there uh, for your further consideration later on. The Triple C looked into misuse of public resources and how seven agencies, so this is not local government, were dealing with the risk of it occurring. So just setting up there in 2021, that was the scope, the first three bullet points. The third one is, is essentially a strange one. It's quite random. It's out of, um, as a result of the first two objectives, 
um, allegations and incidents occurring. They attacked on fuel consumption fraud when the, to my knowledge, when the um, investigators were out and about, certain things came to their attention around fuel management and the scope was extended to look at that specific risk alone and provide you know, some detailed uh, recommendations about what organisations need to be doing. So if we were to think about, say, TMR as one of the agencies, I don't know who they are, but as one of the agencies, fuel management and control for themselves and contractors would be you know, a substantial cost and, and you know, highly attractive for pilfering. So that, that was an interesting uh, extension of scope in, in my mind um, and something for you know, local government to take on board. And some councils are doing that proactively, looking you know, at that fuel element um, a little bit more closely and improving their controls around the monitoring uh, and reporting. Good news, in 2021, Triple C identified they ha those agencies had satisfactory outcomes. Most of the audited cases were appropriately dealing with allegations. Uh, they had sound policies and procedures relating to the use of public resources. So that's the documents. That's not the practices on the ground, but they were satisfied with the documents. Um, they were of the view that there was uh, appropriate awareness raising, you know, professional development, training, um, at induction and then and then beyond about the risk of misuse of resources. So again, that's not whether it's occurring or not. And there were sound regimes for monitoring, uh, which was was really pleasing. Um, and sound probably indicates adequate. So I think generous in saying there's some room for improvement there, which were around record keeping and conduct of investigations, insufficient records to allow investigations to occur something that's actually really quite significant and goes to a fraud indicator is secondary employment um, by officers. So people who are struggling financially may well take secondary employment um, in order to supplement their income. So that's another area just to keep in mind around behaviours. And there really should be a register as it's suggested here or councils should take a position on this um, I believe, and rather than let it be silent. Bulk fuels we've talked about, bulk fuels again, um, and then bulk fuels around adequacy and automation for accuracy of data. So I think there are clearly honing in on the opportunities for improvement around, around fraud. Um, how to go about it was um, some advice from Crime and Corruption Commission about um, a guide in 2023, really good document, fairly sizable. This is just the key hits. Um, there's a chapter purely dedicated to the local government sector, whereas the rest was more broad. So that signaled to me, you know, that there was a more intensive focus on that. So you can read that however you, you, you take that. There was an expectation to adopt preventative perspective rather than a detective control perspective. Pers sorry, perspective. Now that's costly, trying to prevent it versus detect it and then deal with it. So there has been recognition by the Triple C that there's a need to balance the prevention costs um, and have them scaled to the size of the organisation. And they've given just here in these four boxes, essentially some rationale or decision-making tool as to how organisations should start to consider whether the prevention costs and the cost benefit versus relying on detection um, or keeping in mind the wider risks and the reputation elements for that. Um, there were no excuses for laxing on the fundamentals that would, for the most part, need to be key internal controls around prevention, just your bread and butter controls. So there was no acceptance that they should not be in place and rationalised away as a result of scale. And so size of council, but they were very clear on fit for purpose, which is probably one of the times we've seen some uh, an agency come out with a recognition 
you know, of the resourcing implications of, of regional and remote councils. So that was at least pleasing. Look at that decision tool yourself and share it with CEOs and others. And your audit committee, I think, would benefit from seeing that. So this is a crime and corruption dashboard. The reason I have it here, very, very busy. Um, you can drop, so I'll just use my cursor, you can drop on any year you would like. It also breaks down to quarters. Um, I've looked at it sort of holistically, 740, no, 7,000, nearly 7,500 complaints over that period in the local government sector alone. So they've got the other sectors of government here you can click on, but we're only interested in local government today. Um, related to, by and large, council employees. So this is who the complaints were about, councillors, mayors, CEOs, and then and then rolling down from there. So those, those tick some fairly high um, percentages you know, we're certainly around maybe two thirds being council employees. Over the years, and even when I've looked at the data in 21, 23, and 22 and a half of 23, there is consistency here, um, which is the high level categorization of the complaints being misuse of authority, misappropriate or unused, um, unauthorized use of resources. So it's cut off when you look at the dashboard failure to perform the duty as required or instructed and misuse of confidential in, um, information. All the rest sitting down here, a lot of them do, sec some of them do look like the behaviours of fraudsters that we talked about earlier. The subcategories um, that we'll run through, so these are consistent. The first one's misuse of um, authority to be benefit others, so suppliers, Customers, developers, contractors, um, the like, just um, lobby politics as well around that. So misuse to benefit others. Pure fraud and theft, we've talked about occupational fraud. And then misuse of authority to benefit self is that one, um, which I think is fairly, fairly clear and goes to the fraud aspects as well. Um, but misuse of, of authority, and that is the bullying, intimidation, defensiveness hierarchy um, elements sitting there quite clearly. So these ones tend to be the top three in every year. Uh, and then these other ones do jump around a bit, but the entire list is consistent uh, across every, um, every year. The takeaways is what sectors they're happening in. So procurement hits it every single year, not surprising. Um, information control and management, so records, record keeping, that's the creation of documents um, and the manipulation of documents we talked about. Payroll, of course. Um, the other one is recruitment and selection, and that does come through around uh, nepotism, fit for purpose, um, EBA, salary wage rates, increments, elevation of um, staff beyond increments, um, you know, that their skills allow. Um, failure to recognise further learning um, or skills, uh, um, degrees and, and certificates and such appropriately, really coming to favouritism in that space ultimately in internally um, and with um, new recruits, even though it says just employees and selection. Um, DAs uh obvious for local government the other one that sits here and does elevate up and down this list to about halfway in some of these years and more recent years is fleet management um, there's more software out there to be able to detect inappropriate use of fleet um, because you know the the movements um, and the time in place some councils are really embracing this technology and as a result there's escalating allegations coming forward of misuse of plant and fleet, uh, including um, use on weekends for private purposes, tying into that secondary employment aspect. But um, I'll jump on from there. There's a dashboard on the Triple C uh, website, really useful um, information to share. And what I would say here is if these areas or any of these actually, are not contemplated in your fraud risk register, they really need to be. 
certainly sort of the top 10. So that's a little bit of a um, pressure test for your um, fraud and corruption risk register uh, for a sanity check there. And that's helpful, again, in advising audit committees. Office of Information Commissioner uh, has a whole pile, 12 months to December. Um, notifications are down. Malicious attacks are up. This is for um, inappropriate information leaving the organisation and by what means it is taken. So 70% criminal um, human error. You know, we've got a lot to do. That's down. Um, so that's really pleasing. And system faults. Our reliance on technology is going to drive some of that. 63% of the lost data. So again, we're in a really one third, two thirds type situation with all of this, affected less than 100 people. Um, the balance was greater than uh, emails of personal um, information to wrong recipients, recipients, unintended disclosure or release. So sometimes just, and when we see it with new counsellors, just the lack of clarity on what they can and can't talk about. Um, and then the unintended consequence of that and their disclosures, but officers as well. And that's a bit of a um, information is power. Uh, again, uh, types of culture comes behind that. And then just loss of paperwork and storage, inability to find it, um, inadvertent release. Happening in these sectors, so health services, malicious attack, we all know how um, wonderful that data is to the dark web and then finance um, as well. What did they occur from? So cybersecurity incidents is the majority. There are others, but I haven't brought them to your attention. In 2023, it's ransomware. I've got a live example or a real life example a bit later on. And compromise or stolen credentials and phishing sitting up there. So comp compromise and stolen credentials, nearly 30%. Phishing, nearly 20%. That's 50% of your hit in there. Um, and then when we look at the bottom, the comparison in 2019 was much higher. This is by incident number, so I don't have the comparable percentages. But you can, you can see that those top three are um, common kinds of information that's been lost, um, and a lot of it's relational. So sometimes it's contact information, then it's identity information, then financial information, and it can then be combined to give real quality data for those on the dark web who are wanting to purchase that. So the relationships get drawn together um, by the hackers to have a suite of very usable data um, for which you know, others will perpetrate crimes or they will themselves. In Australia, um, half, just the two half years sitting here, how many breaches that have been reported have affected over 5,000 Australians? So some really interesting ones sitting here. And you can probably get an indication of which ones, you know, here might be Medibank and which ones sort of might be Optus and there's more to come. How quickly identified mostly in less than 30 days. But to me, that's interesting and a little bit scary that it's up to 30 days. Um, is the, So some of those could be 30 days on the knock up. Um, pleasingly, it's within a fairly short time frame of four weeks. But to me, that's, that's still an extensive risk. I'll leave you to look at this one in the pack after um, it talks about the types of organisations, small business, probably reflects some of the regional and remote councils in terms of sizing. Um, the cybersecurity centres also, you know, wants to indicate to us that they're doing their job by answering calls and things like that in the bottom right-hand corner of the slide deck. So easy targets for users. There's three types now, um, and all the wording, technical jargon, phishing, We'd all largely know what that is, emails and websites, highly sophisticated, and they've become very, very legitimate looking, um, very difficult to detect. Um, jump onto that link if you're interested in the most common types. 
um, there's some really good indications of what to look for sitting in that um, that link. But busy emails um, coming from certain seemingly legitimate sources, including portals. So just keep that that in mind. Vishing is phone calls from imposters to key employees in the organisation, either representing management or suppliers, suppliers or recently joining recruited employees with bank details, et cetera, wanting them to be changed. So they're targeting recruitment, payroll people, accounts payable, finance people. This is the most, most effective and least costly now for cyber criminals is this approach, imposters. Um, and it's working a treat for them. That's why they're spending a lot more time in here. Be mindful. Takeaway is for people that are working in these sectors in all organisations, but in local government, be really mindful what you've got. <clears throat> excuse me on your LinkedIn and Facebook pages about the nature of the work you do for local government. That's how they find you initially, and then they background stalk you and move on from there um, through your councils and obviously more widely. Uh, smishing text messages, these are nailing the less literate, the won't happen to me's and the trusting generations of the boomers in the early year Gen X's. Um, and so, so there's some work to do around community education um, rather than local government educating its community, but um, just so you're aware. Councils and organisations do have controllable factors. It's really important not to just say this is going to happen around us overconfidence and intentional blindness in cybersecurity protection and maturity happens in organisations. I hear it quite often from leadership, um, those reporting to audit committees um, around the overhead cost. It's going to happen anyway. We'll deal with it when it happens or it won't happen to us. Um, and just not supporting the development of the maturity of the IT personnel resources that you have to try and bring in um, to get to the essential eight, level three level of maturity. So um, those are coming through from uh, local governments. Um, your IT people may and probably should um, self-assess against the essential eight maturity assessment and then start bringing that up to order committees uh, and obviously senior management. And it covers um, and it, it's perpetrated in easier and controllable within local government because you're trying to find efficiencies, but those controls aren't necessarily considered or that support and investment for cybersecurity around the mobility where you're trying to get efficiencies, first source of information upload. So you want to reduce the duplication of information entered. So you're wanting first source uploads. Those are usually at the coalface with less mature um, security measures, shared portals and cryptocurrency is, is coming through thick and fast. Councils are uh, not embracing that yet, but I think the risk profile is there. Um, scam delivery methods. This is from the ACCC scam watch data. Um, got a shout out to BDO. They've taken all of that data and they've put together a report. This is the key elements as to how the scams are being perpetrated um, over the various quarters, telling information, get it in front of the key people in your organisations, I think, is where um, why this is so important. There is a full report that BDO have uh, on their website, and it's really worthwhile um, getting that. Um, I found it incredibly useful. There's a lot more information um, in there. So for you supporting your IT personnel, um, in your audit committees, it should be a standing item on, on the agenda. Queensland Audit Office is starting to expect that now. And this gives IT professionals and yourselves an opportunity to bring it to the table every single meeting. Um, and it's important that that's, that education is occurring. I talked about dishonourable mentions. So this is back with the Association of um, Certified Fraud Examiners. They, they look at the absolute clangers um, that happen worldwide. So I've just grabbed the top three just to take you through some real life examples of how this is impacted and who it's impacted. Um, and this is fraud and corrupt conduct. And it's not all cyber, um, it's behavior. So 
um, in the tech area, cryptocurrency mogul, he stole or lost 10 billion from customers that invested in his companies for cryptocurrency. He funded political contributions, had venture capital, um, was an investment angel, a lot to bolster his personal ego, the extravagant lifestyle again, sitting there. Um, so it was looking for influence, looking for recognition and to bolster ego was what you know, led to this. He bankrupted the companies that he was involved in after he offloaded his own shares at, an, you know, at a reasonable fair price that the market would pay. The organisations tanked because of the frauds that he was committing and shareholders lost clearly all of their money. I don't have the data on how much they lost. He was caught um, somewhat by whistleblowers and then his um, uh, the other perpetrators that surrounded him that he had co-opted in um, basically flipped on him and he got 115 years prison sentence. Sure, parole will be there, but that's one of the most significant convictions as it should be. Um, to send a message. Human trafficking for fraud, this is a fairly desperate uh, type of fraud that was initiated, proliferated in COVID, people smuggling by crime syndicates for in excess, you know, of hundreds of thousands of people from, um, you know, poverty Asia, um, holding them captive, forcing them to engage in these things, exactly the same type of people smuggling and human trafficking that we've seen in other um, other areas is now applying in this case. COVID allowed the crime syndicates to basically take over empty casinos, warehousing facilities and hotels that had been closed um, naturally. And then essentially those became the, the farms, um, scam farms essentially uh, for, for doing this. And then vishing attacks occurred. So a proud group of hackers, Gen Z, claim responsibility for essentially knocking out Caesars and MGM uh, and all of their casinos over various stages. They went through loyalty programs, which may or may not have been the um, main target organisation's loyalty programs. So when I was saying, uh, looking at you know, your other entry points, these were the ones that had the weaknesses because casinos have got notoriously strong, strong um, security measures. So what was taken um, through the initial infiltration was driver's license and social security numbers, you know, obviously US context. Um, Caesars paid the ransoms. That was their decision. MGM didn't. 31 casinos worldwide came to a halt in prolonged attacks over 11 days. The disruption to their business was really everything. Slot machines going down, lights going off, room keys not opening, lifts seizing, um, all of it. Uh, so loads of fun for those hackers um, and just critical what they can do. So if we apply that then to local government essential services, you know, it's got some parallels in terms of that risk profile. Um, probably even more so given the responsibility to the community. So we're coming to the end, um, probably thankfully for your um, points of view, guys, and some questions I see popping up. Um, how can you help and what can the Audit and Risk Committee do around this space? It's got a little bit of an IT bent here because that's probably the most susceptible um, external threat, uh, but equally a lot of the op occupational fraud and corruption I've said to you sort of sits within here anyway. So it's really composition and upskilling of audit and risk committee members and looking for varied expertise. So trying to look at your emerging, your emerging trends of risk, not necessarily in IT, but there's plenty more um, to you know, seeking that to supplement, you know, the knowledge around the table. I think the legislation, you know, it prescribes, well, it certainly does pres prescribe the finance knowledge, um, but I think, you, you know, certainly expanding that is important. 
upskilling elected members when IT um, security and frameworks and all sorts of things started to become very clear risk areas for audit and risk committee members. You know, councillors would say to me, you know, in confidence and absolutely understand where they were coming from, that they didn't understand this area and the complexity. So how could they effectively do any kind of oversight and review function? They need support. Um, and as they know clearly now from the Isaac Regional Council example um, and others, that the complexity is no excuse um, and not that those councillors at Isaac Regional Council, not suggesting that they were oblivious in any way, shape or form. I used to be the audit committee chair there and I know we'd had these conversations many times. So just a caveat on that comment. Skills matrix would be one way to isolate any skills gaps. Um, this could be perhaps another role for governance, not that you don't have enough to do. Uh, supplement with external advisors. If you're on a committee members or you can't afford them anymore or they're not available in your sort of communities or areas, look for non-member external advisors to come in with key hit information. Audit committees really do need to stand up and make some strong recommendations to council for consideration. Um, and having that avenue move through to the ordinary meeting, you know, and councillors make some decisions on those actual recommendations for action, given audit and risk committees are advisory only. Risk oversight, the fraud register, risk register biannually, IT risk register every meeting. Um, they need to be querying the investment in risk mitigation, the effectiveness of your BCP and essential services as a result of those targets. And they really need to be querying the breaches the question that I ask is, does the reality of what's being brought to the table by IT professionals around breaches, and full disclosure is always appreciated, does that actually match the risk ratings that are in the risk register? Or are the controls that are uh, documented in the risk register relied upon as effective, but the breaches and the other things we find out perhaps don't indicate overconfidence? Get accountability from your vendors, have your IT team and service providers in the room. You know, being able to share it from specialists is important. Use the case studies that I've just given you in the top three, by all means. Governance reporting to highlight the trends, the themes and governance practices, maintaining confidentiality. That goes to the risk oversight. Is what's happening on the ground and is being notified to audit committees actually reflecting management's view of the risk in the risk register. Plug for internal audit and specialists, those types of things, you know, are essential to the, the controls and their effectiveness. Internal phishing campaigns, if your councils can afford it, please, um, please do so. And then data analysis, self-assessment and monitoring. It can't prevent it but it must detect it fast. And this is the efficiency um, of the internal control and analysis. You can't prevent it it's, at times, it's very costly, but you must get it at the back end. That's the way you do it. Also, in my experience, it's called the placebo effect. Many of you understand that, but it influences behaviour. So if the organisation believes that they are being monitored because questions are being asked from time to time, or a data analysis profile sits across the organisations or effective reports are going up to senior management, whether they are or not, if the belief is there, it influences behaviour. So that is a personal takeaway from me about how you can leverage what you are doing, even if you don't have the full suite or can't afford it or don't have the time. What you are doing, broadcast it. It will maintain appropriate behaviour. These are the key takeaways. They'll be in the slide pack. These are from my experience. Uh, and I think that they're, they're obviously key or I wouldn't have put it up there. Thank you. 10 minutes to go uh, and time for questions. So back to you. Okay, thanks, Carolyn, for the presentation. Um, and now we'll move on to the questions from our live audience. Um, so the first question we have is, did we see a change in the fraud profile for local government during the COVID pandemic with working from home and hybrid working arrangements? Uh, yes, profile has increased, risk has increased, potential 
has increased. Um, certainly with remote access, their entry points that are usually a little more difficult or expensive to protect. Um, so the profile is certainly heightened and the exploitable elements there are now known worldwide to hackers because they have been now instituted as business as usual. Did you see a change in the um, the corruption and employee fraud, uh, fraud profile as well? Um, just with those stats that you had on that first um, slide were really comprehensive. Um, not specifically, I'd have to say we, we haven't looked at that ourselves. Um, the overarching element within the that report to the nations from the fraud examiners, it has indicated that COVID has been exploited substantially um, in regards to occupational fraud. And there will be some uh, infographics on the types of areas where where that covers. So I'd encourage you know to better answer that question with some facts. Just jump in and have a look at that. Okay, so we'll move on to the next question. Um, with the ATO introducing the e-invoicing platform and mandating federal government agencies to have in place, there appears to be some benefits um, to local government utilising this. Do you think there'll be a push for local governments to adopt um, or incorporate this in their processes? I'm not close to that particular area. Um, and I'm not your accountant, accountant, uh, so probably hard to say. Yeah. But if the state government context is any point of reference to what's been um, directed for local government to do, I would see it on a pathway to being, you know, mandated at some point. But I don't see local government as being the guinea pig for the rollouts of that. Um, in the first instance. So there's a lot of opportunity for lessons learned um, in that process. Um, so I'd, I'd say it's a watch and wait for mine. Thank you, Carolyn. Um, and we do have some time if you want to send some more questions through. We've still got a few to get through. Um, so we've got one here on a limited or restricted cyber budget. Uh, what would be the best funding allocation to strategy to mitigate against risks? So, for example, allocating allocate to address the most likely exposure points, disregard others, spread them. Um, so this person has written that their concern is by allocating to the higher risk areas and not covering all the bases. This could lead to potential reputational risk if things go wrong in those less likely areas of exposure. Mm -hmm. Thoughts? There's a real balance there. I think that's an excellent question. Excellent question. Um, based on some reluctance to fund overhead and the per perception that it is pure overhead. In a way it is, but it is a fundamental cost of doing business now across local government. Uh, and there can't be intentional blindness to that risk. So to answer the question, I can't answer it in terms of percentages, but great question, where do you spend your time and effort and money? What I would take you back to, um, and I would like to see as an audit committee member, is a, a, even if it's a quick and dirty self-assessment about the five of the key five in the essential eight um, from the signals directorate, and which ones do an assessment, just a maturity assessment one to five scale, uh, and then assess what you could feasibly do around those, what you have got in place, what you haven't, what you can afford, then I would apply that against the fraud risk register or the organisation's corporate risk register that relates to IT and um, information security. And then I would take the conversation to management because this sits around risk appetite and risk tolerance. And I think it's... Um, not appropriate to leave that decision making to officers that aren't around the exec table and aren't at the audit committee table and aren't at the councillor table. Because risk appetite and risk tolerance is set by council and it directs management as to where that effort should be should be put. And from there, 
risk tolerance is what they're able to tolerate if something goes wrong. So that's the conversation. And it's difficult to communicate that to counsellors, but they need to understand that it can't be covering everything and they need to provide that direction. Should it be targeted, recognising the potential for these other things? And if it was to occur, what would happen to the organisation and how would the organisation cope with that? So that's the prevention versus detection and the allocation scarce resources. That's how I'd approach it. Um, very much at that leadership level, but super good question. That was an awesome question. Um, and every every organisation, um, you know, no matter how big, um, community groups, local governments, there is scarce resources and it's how do you prioritise um, and, and the people making the decisions, how do you make sure that they've got all the information uh, to make those decisions because they're not, the, they're not necessarily the experts either. Um, we've got a whole new bunch of councillors starting um, after these recent elections and, you know, they're going to have to wrap their head around this and work with their audit committees um, to, you know, avoid all of these um, where possible, these risks, reduce these risks. So um, we've got a, a couple more questions. Um, so we've got one here um, talking about our um, the fleet, uh, you know, and fleet fraud and fleet tracking. So we've got one here that says, our council is moving towards GPS tracking for our fleet, but has met with resistance from the staff who have concerns about privacy. What kind of response do you recommend to a recommendation like this? It certainly makes me wonder what's going on out there that might be discovered. <laughs> yeah, very common, very common to have the resistance um, coming through uh, around privacy or, you know, probably not described. I haven't heard it described like that. Um, that does uh, you know, get me thinking. Um, the rationale that is used is worker safety, remote worker working alone. And they're the one working alone is where the accountability can drop away for, to be productive. So there are numerous examples that um, I've come across, not necessarily anecdotally and professionally, um, where officers with Lightfleet uh, you know, I parked up one gentleman, had a great time fishing um, off the jetty somewhere slightly remote. There's then um, plant, and fleet, plant and fleet downtime for both contractors and um, council plant in that it really should be working if you're getting through the work during the weekday and then how much overtime is being clocked on the weekends or after hours and then how much idle time has that plant um, got during those periods of time and that signals productivity and obviously plant utilization and the hours that they're generating idle you know is not actually good from our maintenance point of view either so yes the rationale is safety um, and awareness and location of remote uh, remote worker and single single worker it's a hard conversation yep. to have but it works yes um it, it can it can work um particularly from that safety angle when you you know if you lose a staff member it's where are they um you know using that tracking mechanism um to keep them safe um industrial manslaughter for ceos is a really good way mm -hmm. to have that conversation and reach out to some of the councils, the bigger councils that have got it through, because they will mm. have been able to have those conversations with their unions. Yeah. Um, I'd recommend, I guess, um, uh, to the person who put this question, um, if you're a member of LGFP, um, jump onto the member network and pose the question as to the type of communications um, that other councils undertook with their workforce to, I guess, bring them on board. Um, because I have seen at previous councils where the devices have been disconnected um, because of misunderstandings. So, um, so we've got another one here. Oh, jumping back in and, um, you know, 
full disclosure, how you disclosed you were at the audit um, committee, I'm sitting here in Isaac Regional Council. So it's been an interesting um, 12 months with cyber. Um, but here's a question. Are you aware of any local governments actually paying a ransom for a ransomware attack? No, I am not. I, mm. I, I haven't seen those decisions needing to be made. Yeah. So I think we've all seen it in the news where um, commercial um, entities um, have made that, that business decision um, for the affordability. But when we're talking about public monies, it's a, sometimes a different um, decision profile. Um, yeah. Our last one here before we wrap up, we've got a comment here from the QAO. Um, so more of a comment than a question. Um, has everyone seen the QAO fraud alert issued in the last seven days? If not, please ask your CFO for a copy of the details and revisit your vendor and bank account change controls. And thank you for the session, Carolyn, um, from the QAO. So we might follow up with that information to get that on our member network as well. Um, so I just wanted to thank everyone for um, attendance and thank you again for the presentation, Carolyn. Um, it really is an eye opener when you see all those stats um, and the things that are happening. The world is changing and we work in organisations where our employees and the, the communities we, we service are spanning all the generations um, and still in our workforce too. Um, it's really hard, as you said, there's different scams targeting different generations, um, you know, different backgrounds. It's a lot for us to get our head around and how we can help protect our, our communities um, and our, um, our organisations. Um, so before we go, um, we've got a few minutes left, but before we go, this is from the um, LGFP committee. So a copy of the webinar recording will be available on our YouTube channel in the coming days and the presentation slides will be available to members through the members library on our website. Um, you can follow us on LinkedIn um, for upcoming webinar details. Now, next webinar will be held on the 2nd of May on service planning. Um, what else have we got here? Our, 2000, our 2024, I can't believe we're in 2024, end of Q, quarter one, uh, quarter three for the financial year. Our 2024 Financial Professionals Forum will be held in Brisbane on the 26th of July um, and registration is free for LGFP members. And then we've got our um, annual conference. Um, it's our flagship event and it's being held on the Gold Coast this year. Um, and it's from the 19th to the 22nd of November. So mark your diaries and I hope to see you all there. Um, as we've said a few times throughout this um, presentation, um, if you want some advice or you have a question, you're not sure, you know, most people have done the, done the everything that you're doing now has been done before. Um, so pop it onto our LGFP members network. Um, and if you're not an LGFP member and you'd like to join, just see the membership area of our website or email us on admin at lgfp.org.au. So I'll just leave you off by saying um, to all the Queensland local government finance professionals in our audience um, and probably a few um, probably a few governance professionals as well um, from the presentation. I just wish you a smooth transition welcoming in your new councillors and good luck with your budgets and interim audit visits. Um, and just a reminder, it's going to be end of financial year before we know it. Uh, so to help you prepare, it's worth checking out our 2023 webinar on enhancing financial reporting maturity, which is on our YouTube channel. Um, and it's all about improving your future month end and year end reporting processes. So that's a good one just to revisit, um, particularly if you've got new staff um, in your organisation. But thanks again, Carolyn, um, for the presentation and we'll see hopefully everyone in the audience uh, in May at our next one. Thanks very much. Thank you so much.